When I wake up, chapter 11. When I wake up, a man with a crescent scar on his right cheek looms over me. I have never seen him before. He is small boned with a large head and a close set eyes. Who is this man? Where am I? Where is my family? The faint memory of Jatine T in the taxi wash over me. I sit up. Who are you? He stares down at me, cross-eyed. I am your boss. Is this the factory Jatine told me about? Are you his uncle? He laughs. His scar bunches up. Did he tell you he was taking you to his uncle? Yes, you know Jatine, the boy who brought me here. That boy is something, Scarman shakes his head in amusement. I know him. I just didn't know his name was Jatine this time. I don't like the way he says his name was Jatine this time. Who is Jatine? What's his real name? Why am I here? I look around. The insides of the front and back doors have latches and they are closed with iron locks on them. Fear digs in my heart. This place doesn't look like a factory. It is just one rectangular room with a window on each long side. The wooden shutters are closed and the room is lighted by a single fluorescent tube light. I'm on a floor made of rough stones that no one has washed for many monsoons and the paint on the wall is smeared with stains. Some of them are red. Is it beetle leaf juice or blood? The ceiling is made of wooden boards, so there must be a room upstairs. A wall clock with yellowed, faded, unre unreadable numbers ticks away as its brass pendulum moves back and forth, back and forth. I look away from it before I get dizzy. The man sits down on a cushion on a bench that runs almost the length of the room. There is a TV across from the seat. The kitchen is in the far corner. A narrow bamboo ladder leans against one wall. I pick up my blue raincoat and hold it close to my chest. It helps me steady myself. Do you have work for me? Sure do. My throat aches and my lips are dry. I move my tongue over them and they have a parched scaly feel like the earth before monsoon. I'm thirsty. Have some water, Scarman says. He shuffles to the kitchen, fills up a tumbler and hands it to me. I clutch the dented tumbler and gulp down the water. When I try to hand it back to Scarman, he snarls. I'm not your servant, you're mine. From the cracks between the shutters, I can tell it is dark outside and I know Ai must be waiting for me. I want to go home now, I say. Where, back on the street? To my Ai. Are you still a baby or what? Grow up, your Ai is in here and you must earn your keep. You are staying here. Let me go. I push myself up. He whacks me on the cheek and I fall back down. Scarman hits me again. Stay there, you rat. I cover my head with my raincoat, put my hands on top of it, and curl up into a ball. Baba never kicked or slapped us. He used to say, animals don't beat their own babies, and if we think we are better than animals, then we must behave at least as well as animals. So I decide that a person who hits me doesn't deserve man behind his name. He doesn't even deserve beast behind his name. He is scar, just scar, nothing more. Up, he shouts. Slowly, I get up. My head feels empty like my stomach. I need food. Here is the thing, boy, Scar says. Tomorrow, you'd better be ready to work. Where have I heard here is the thing? It is familiar, but I can't think anymore. My mind is a fog-enveloped mountain. As a wave of sickness moves in, I close my eyes and collapse on the floor. Scar, his voice and the room all disappear. Wake up, lazy boy, I hear. I open my eyes. It is Scar standing nearby. His feet remind me of the policeman who kicked me the first night we slept on the station's footpath. Morning light filters through the half-closed shutters and the room looks dirtier than it did last night. Spiderwebs wink in the far corner and a couple of black ants scurry across the floor under Scar's wooden bench are boxes, a stack of newspapers, and several jute bags.